Thank you, John, for your very complimentary remarks. Uh, room for a little collect correction here and there, but we won't go into that now. <laughs> First, the good news. My orthopedic surgeon has advised me that if I stand here for 15 or 20 minutes, <clears throat> I have a good chance of falling flat on my face. <laughs> I shall try to bear that in mind. While I sought inspiration from the remarks of the distinguished predecessors who stood here before me, hoping to avoid sending you into either into a blissful snooze or grasping frantically for the nearest bottle of spirits, I fell back on advice reportedly once given by General Donovan himself at a boring staff meeting. In effect, he said, quote, if you've got something to say, at least know what you're talking about. <laughs> Stick to the point, and above all, be brief. I'll try to do that. He then rose and left the room. Heeding his wise advice, I proposed to explain some of the operations in which I participated as a member of the OSS X2 detachment at the 12th Army Group headquarters in Europe. I hastened to note that I had no idea that I was working for X2. In fact, I did not learn of that designation and what it meant until long afterwards, since we were officially known only as a 12th Army Group Special Counterintelligence Detachment, OSCI, SCI Detachment. It would help if these pages didn't stick together. <laughs> Which some said was deliberately intended to create confusion with the counterintelligence corps units organic to all combat divisions. To understand the origins and justification for the branch of OSS known as X2 requires a brief digression key to the decision by Churchill to share with FDR alone the fact that the British had succeeded in breaking the German Enigma cipher machine, a secret referred to by Churchill only, only as his golden eggs. There is still uncertainty over when and how Churchill actually revealed this information to FDR, but it seems unlikely that General Donovan learned of it until much later. Meanwhile, Donovan argued vigorously on the need for OSS to have a counterintelligence arm for its own internal protection, leading to a protracted battle with the FBI and the Pentagon in which Donovan was ultimately successful because of his relationship with FDR, leading him to comment at the time that he had more enemies in Washington than he did in all of Europe. <laughs> Thus, X2 was born, but with no fanfare. The designation of X2 for this new branch reportedly was adapted from a British unit known as XB, also with counterintelligence responsibilities. X2 from the beginning was small, secretive, and led many, <coughs> led many other elements of the OSS to complain that X2 was so secret that it often did not know what it was supposed to be doing, a charge not entirely without foundation. <laughs> when OSS deployed to Europe under Colonel David Bruce, a very small X2 unit was also included but largely independent of Bruce's organization. The latter operated in tandem with its British counterpart, the SOE, Special Operations Executive, to, quote, set Europe ablaze, unquote, as Churchill declared when he created this resistance organization for irregular warfare and to stir up resistance to German occupation by any means, fair or foul. <clears throat> the X2 branch of OSS, initially consisting of only two officers, was set up at a considerable physical distance from Bruce's headquarters in order that the X2 office could liaise directly with the British MI6, the traditional foreign intelligence organization. MI6 was also the unit in charge of British code breaking, including Ultra, the Enigma product. And when the US was brought into closer cooperation on this, in this very sensitive field, especially after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. All liaison in London, in this area, 
was conducted exclusively by the X2 office there, which expanded modest, very modestly over time. Just as there was animosity between SOE and MI6, between, if you will, the activists and the pacifists, so it was also true that there was some tension between the OSS London under David Bruce and the orphans of X2, who were considered to be aloof and distant by David Bruce's much larger and activist paramilitary operators. What, if anything, David Bruce and his staff were told about X2's principal role in London is far from clear, then and now. Meantime, X2 in London was putting a toe in the water with a skeptical and at times downright dismissive MI6 into the counter espionage field. X2 London personnel were also subject to the highly restrictive travel controls, as was also true of their British counterparts. They were prohibited from deployment to the continent even after the June 6th invasion of Normandy without the prior agreement of both US and British authorities, and there were very stringent contingent uh, conditions attached there too. If you think, by the way, that I'm finally getting to the point, you can sit back and relax, <laughs> for, for you are correct. In fact, X2 personnel deployed to the continent not only had no knowledge of the code and cipher activities of X2 London, they were not even permitted to acknowledge belonging to OSS itself, since they wore military uniforms and could only acknowledge belonging to a 12th Army group or similar intelligence organization. They had wide authority to move throughout the theater as required and were not answerable to local allied military authorities. Happily, however, someone at a more senior level understood that this freewheeling approach was a recipe for disaster. As a result, some of us at the sharp end of the stick were provided with what was called quote, the Eisenhower Pass, a fancy document actually signed by the Supreme Commander with an individual's picture, but no name, and a brief text in German, French, English, and Russian, authorizing the bearer to requisition any form of support for the accomplishment of a mission under the direct authority of the Supreme Allied Commander. The document provided only Eisenhower's signature as authentication but it also bore a telephone number at shape of a supposedly manned 24 seven, which upon receipt of the number of the document could confirm the bearer's authorities. We also had a password, individual password connected to the document that only the bearer could use in case of challenge. When this document was issued, we were told that without fail, it had to be returned intact if the war ever ended, and we would never see, or we would never see the USA again. <laughs> Needless to say, we took great care of this treasure and used it sparingly, although it did serve us well when need arose. I won't go into some of the times we you did use it, but uh, <clears throat> it was very helpful, particularly with Eisenhower's signature on it. Lest you think by now I had forgotten my admonition at the beginning, I'll jump ahead to the instances where we actually were directed to execute missions beyond the front lines, although there were others proposed that had to be scratched for a variety of reasons. The first involved instructions to sneak into the outskirts of Munich to arrest a senior, neighbor, senior Nazi party and SS officer for delivery to the general officer prisoner holding point at Oberursel outside Frankfurt on Main. Although fighting was still, still going on in and around Munich, there was sufficient confusion that with care one could slip in and out again if one took precautions. While we did wear US uniforms, they bore no obvious US insignia, and we often used a captured German Kubewagen, sort of the German equivalent of our Jeep, sufficiently battered so that it was not immediately identifiable as an American vehicle. Even our Jeeps were also dirty, unkempt, and bore no obviously American identification on the bumpers. We were always supplied with excellent maps, however, overhead photography, and other details, such as, where possible, the actual street address of a target. If you wonder how that was possible, so did we, 
but it was made very clear that we were given all available information on the target and could not ask for more details. There weren't any. If you're beginning to smell a rat, you're getting close to this. The real answer, of course, where much of this detail, detail was probably coming from, but never confirmed. In any event, the Munich suburb in question at the time we got there was quiet and relatively undamaged. So we found the address in the early morning hours, pounded on the front door with a colleague around and back just in case. As we were about ready to force the door open, it slowly opened and there stood a tall, thin man in the colorful livery of a gentleman's gentleman, or British butler, who did not say a word. We asked to speak to the presumed owner, a man with the unlikely name of the Baron Radio von Radies, the radio of radios, a South Tyrolean of considerable means who presumably knew a great deal about Nazi party financial shenanigans. Almost immediately, the presumed butler disappeared and returned shortly to announce in flawless British English, the Baron is not receiving today. In spite of our bursting into laughter, the cocking of our weapons changed his mind. And loud protestations from the presumed butler and his master to the contrary, we roused the Baron from his comfortable chair and took him to the Jeep. As we drove off, one of our team leaned out, shouted at the outraged butler, cheer up, old chap, we could have been Russians. <laughs> the good Baron was duly delivered to Oberursel. On another occasion, we were tasked to proceed deep inside what was to become the Soviet zone of Germany, beyond Weimar, to apprehend a named German scientist, given his full street address in a small town, and even with maps, and, rarely the case, an actual aerial photograph of the neighborhood. As was so often the case, we went to our good friend and supporter, Colonel Oscar Koch, longtime G2 of Patton's Third Army, because we knew that his Second Armored Division, also known as Hell on Wheels, was making a thrust into the area and would provide a diversion, if not more, which might let us in and, and before our odd vehicle caught anyone's attention. As we drove to a side road, we saw that American tanks had passed there and left a small yellow flag, which meant take another route. This one's likely to be trouble. So we veered off on a tangent where through the woods ahead of us, we could see a clearing of sorts and detected a frightful smell. We slowed our pace and crept forward to a point in the clearing where we could see a large barbed wire enclosure with a few pathetic figures moving about. When we came somewhat closer, saw three rows of barbed wire fencing, one obviously electrified. While we could then see many piles of corpses, there were a few scrawny, pathetic souls, and to our surprise, a few older Germans, still in uniform, outside the fence with their hands in the air who wanted to surrender to us. We had no idea what to do with them. We had no room for them and did not want to take prisoners. One of the pathetic souls at the fence, no longer electrified, in broken English asked if anyone knew Eddie Cantor. And when I answered yes, of course, he brightened and answered that Eddie Cantor was his cousin in the United States. In short, we handed over our cigarettes, much more valuable than money, and said we would call for medical help as soon as we could. Our new friend said he wanted us to see something and accompanied us to the empty SS headquarters building, where, with tears running down his face, he showed us the array of lampshades of human skin tattoos, which the commandant's wife had removed from prisoners' bodies and mounted for her pleasure. We reassured him at that point that we would summon help as soon as we could, but we had to get on about our own business. As we prepared to leave, he and some of his colleagues hauled down the huge black flag with the double SS ruins and handed it to me as a symbol of their appreciation. I still have that flag, by the way, carefully wrapped in mothballs in hopes that someday it can be displayed in an institution which will celebrate not only the glorious amateurs of OSS, but all the successor organization and heroes who have done so much for our country's security. 
In the event you were wondering, the surviving inmates begged us to leave the German guards to their hands, which we did. Finally, in fulfillment of a process, a promise made to Charles Pink in a moment of great weakness on my part, I will tell briefly of my near fatal, to me that is, encounter with General George Patton, arguably the finest armored commander on either side in World War II, where he was when he was widely known as old blood and guts for good reason. There are many myths surrounding this colorful general, but the following episode is true, except for the editing of his most profane language. In a word, returning from another less successful foray, we did manage to liberate some small red cardboard boxes hidden among documents, which turned out to contain a very elaborate belt buckle with magnificent silver swastika on the front. On closer examination, we identified a catch on the side of the buckle which allowed the front to swing open and two ba pistol barrels swung out, <clears throat> then discharged into the solar plexus of any one ha happened to be standing facing the wearer of this device. Being good soldiers, we wrote a report then delivered to the Quartermaster Corps intelligence people. <clears throat> and since these were magnificent souvenirs, we quietly crafted a planned report claiming to have, quote, heard talk of such weapons, but never seen one, and sent it off through channels. Sometime later, our great help of helper and supporter, Colonel Koch, sent me word that General Patton wished to see me ASAP. So I duly reported in and was greeted with a tirade, which I could not repeat even if I wanted to. Many new words never heard of before or since. <laughs> the general's first words were that I had to be one of the stupidest soldiers he had ever encountered in his entire military career and not worthy to wear the uniform. Completely at a loss to understand what this was afoot was all about, I mumbled the yes sir and waited for the ax to fall. In abbreviated and expurgated form, the general concluded his blast with these words, more or less. <clears throat> as he, and as he shuffled through the papers among his desk, he shortly waved at me a dog-eared single sheet and asked, soldier, is this your signature? I said, uh-oh. To my mumbled yes, sir, he continued, if there are not two of those belt buckles on my desk <clears throat> by 0800 tomorrow morning, I will personally nail the most sensitive parts of your anatomy to the highest flagpole in Luxembourg City. <laughs> Do I make myself clear? <laughs> now get the hell out of here, I have a war to fight. <clears throat> As I staggered out, there stood Colonel Koch with an armload of maps who commented, you look awful. <laughs> Did you just see a ghost or something? Response. Yes, Colonel, and it was my own. <laughs> First footnote, there were two such buckles on the general's desk at 0800 the following morning. Second footnote, yes, I still have my own belt buckle. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still vertical. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here tonight.